Welcome. Today's lecture is on understanding humoral immunity. I have talked about humoral immunity in multiple lectures, but I thought it's worth spending some more time to discuss B cells and the antibodies that they secrete. It's very much of high interest because we're talking about in this in the US and all of the countries over the world, trying to evaluate immunity based on antibodies that develop in either symptomatic or asymptomatic individuals to SARS coronavirus 2. And if you're positive, maybe that's a certificate for you to return to work. But I think the point I wanna make it that it's complicated. We make multiple types of antibodies. They may not be the right function just to um, reiterate and bring home the point that it's not as easy as just getting a single blood test and then you're scot-free. So B cells are made up of multiple types uh, and secrete multiple kinds of antibodies. And we talked about how IgG antibodies are the most dominant form of antibodies present in the peripheral blood. These B cells differentiate in the bone marrow. Their variable portions sees an C antigen um, and the antigen binds to the receptor and you have different millions and millions of kinds of B cells. Every B cell, however, has a single receptor for a specific portion of a viral antigen or a bacterial antigen or even a pathogen or a self antigen. So a B cell binds an antigen, it gets activated. When it gets activated, it then forms many clones of itself. In this example, during a primary immune response, the cell gets activated, forms multiple clones, and then once they're activated, they become plasma cells. And these plasma cells are specialized cells that secrete pump out large amounts of antibodies. So during an acute infection, you have a lot of plasma cells circulating, and these plasma cells secrete tons of antibodies. And these antibodies are directed against the specific portion of the viral antigen in this case that um, it sees. So a portion of these B cells become memory B cells, and it's these memory B cells that are the sentinels for any second infection. So this is a much smaller frequency of cells. They go into the circulation. Some of them go into the bone marrow, and this is a clone of an ancestral cell. But when you have a second infection, so you are re-exposed, as we had discussed previously, if you get re-exposed to SARS coronavirus 2, this memory B cell now, because it's already seen SARS coronavirus earlier, becomes reactivated much quicker and can secrete antibodies at a much faster pace. So a secondary immune response is of an advantage in many, many cases because it's quicker, it's um, more potent, and hopefully can get rid of the infection. So after you finish a secondary uh, response, you will now generate memory B cells to that second infection. So hopefully this frequency is higher and you will generate memory B cells and antibodies that see different portions of the same pathogen. In this slide, I'd like to talk about a new but important concept. There's finite space in the immune system to account for every pathogen that we've been exposed to. And in this slide, I'm just gonna talk about the kinds of B cells that you have what happens before, during, and after SARS infection. So this is just a hypothetical scenario of the subsets of B cells that develop in response to an infection. So all of us have naive B cells, and these are millions and millions of cells, naive B cells, that we, these naive B cells have not been exposed to a pathogen yet, but they have receptors on their cell surface. And some of these receptors will see portions of any pathogen that you potentially can be exposed to. So you have naive B cells to self antigens, viral pathogens, and all of these naive B cells are ready and waiting to get activated. And along those same lines, you also will have naive B cells to SARS pathogen in theory. So in theory, you could have in this example, naive B cells to say the receptor binding domain of the SARS coronavirus spike protein, you might have a different epitope on the spike protein and other proteins as well. For example, the nucleocapsid protein, which is a known target of antibodies as well. So all of these cells are naive cells. They're waiting to respond. And a small portion of the naive B cells are directed against SARS. So that's how your immune systems gets generated initially. 
Now, you also have memory to many other pathogens. So you've been vaccinated or we've all been vaccinated as children. So you have memory B cells that exist in the circulation against as many of these viral, um, of these vaccines and viral pathogens. So for example, all of us have had measles, mumps, and rubella. So there should be a very small frequency of memory B cells to vaccines and other pathogens or, you know, infections like the common cold uh, caused by influenza or you know, other rhinoviruses, etc. So before you have a SARS coronavirus infection, this is what a hypothetical profile of your B cell repertoire should look like. Predominantly naive B cells, a very small portion of naive B cells will be specific to your, the pathogen of interest, which is SARS coronavirus 2. And a number of maybe about 25% of, of the repertoire consists of memory B cells to other pathogens or vaccines that you um, have experienced. That's unique to you. Uh, so every individual based on their immune history will have a different profile. So during SARS coronavirus infection, what happens is you have activation of a number of SARS-specific memory B cells. So these naive B cells have now seen the antigen and many clones then proliferate. So you have a lot more of these green cells and red cells and blue cells. They get activated and I've talked about this in a previous lecture. So they get activated and most and then secrete antibodies. Hopefully the antibodies help clear the infection and eventually the many of these cells die out. Uh, and you will have some memory or much bigger memory to SARS coronaviruses because you were just exposed to it. So during SARS coronavirus infection, you have a lot of activated B cells. Uh, these B cells can now dominate the whole B cell repertoire. So instead of being only say less than 0.2% of your whole repertoire, during an infection, it might even be up to 5% of your repertoire, but there's only still a finite space for them to occupy. So in the process, many other cells might die out. Say other naive cells or other memory B cells might get eliminated in that process. We don't know that yet, and we especially in the context of SARS coronavirus too. So what happens after you've had an infection? So after you've had an infection, again, you have naive B cells. Again, these are cells that are circulating that have not seen any pathogen. You have your memory B cells now, and the memory B cells while they are to other vaccines and other uh, pathogens that you've been exposed to, you now have a new set of memory B cells. This frequency is much lower than during acute SARS infection, or SARS coronavirus 2 infection. So the question really is how many memory B cells do you generate to SARS coronavirus 2? How long are they in circulation? And do they secrete the right kinds of antibodies? Antibodies are of varying specificities and they also can mediate or eliminate a virus uh, via different functions. So the most important function that people discuss or are quite interested in is neutralization. So neutralization is the ability of a, an antibody to bind the virus at a key site. Typically it's at the receptor binding site. So if an antibody is able to block the receptor binding site, then it can prevent the virus from attaching to the host receptor on the cell and therefore prevent infection. So if you have very high titers of neutralizing antibodies, it's more than likely you'll be protected. The question really is how strong are neutralizing antibodies, or how strong are the titers generated in people who have say severe symptoms versus people who have mild symptoms and how long do they last? There are other ways to eliminate the pathogen. So you can opsonize the, uh, or phagocytize the virus or other pathogens. And you can also do it by a mechanism known as ADCC or antibody dependent cellular toxicity. Here, another cell type known as the NK cell with its receptor are able to bind SARS to virus specific antibodies. And these antibodies then recognize portions of antigens presented on antigen presenting cells. So say a phagocyte that captures the SARS virus and presents it on its surface. If that antibody recognizes it and through its other portion, its constant portion by the NK cell, this NK cell then can get activated and then kill this infected cell. So that's one other way of getting rid of an, um, a virally infected cell. Or you can also through the complement pathway, 
eliminate of phagocytos, microbes or pathogens, using complement fragments or lead to inflammation and result in the lysis of microbes. So the question really is, what kinds of antibodies are we generating? In addition to neutralization, are we generating antibodies of different specificities and different functions? What's the proportion of antibodies that are generated with varying functions and how long do they last? That's the key question. How long do they last? Ideally, if they last for years, that's it's a fantastic outcome for anybody. But we don't know that and we're waiting to see and test uh, who has been exposed and has long lasting antibodies and how can we accurately measure them. Given the intense interest in understanding immunity to COVID-19 or sars cov two, I thought it was worth spending the time to talk about B cells um, being the cellular source of antibodies and discussing the types of antibodies that are produced to infections. Uh, talk about the general methods to detect sars cov specific antibodies using ELISA assays and Western blots. Um, and that was in lecture five. I also talked about convalescent plasma therapy where you transfer antibodies from an immune individual with the hopes that those antibodies can uh, decrease severe symptoms. So thank you again for your attention. This is Anuja Matthew and I hope you and I have learned quite a bit about B-cell immunology. Thank you.